being here this morning. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we do ask that we might have a record of your visit. And if you would fill out one of the visitor's cards on the back of the pew in front of you, we have a young man here who will pick those up at the conclusion of the announcements. And you can go about it. Sometimes we get excited up here and we forget to tell them. Uh, also, this is a great time to uh, silence all mobile devices so it's not interfered with the worship song. Uh, there's been the overhead projector speaking of those that are on a sick list. We need to remember those that are shut in, those that are members that are sick, and also the families and friends. A couple of them to talk about specifically. Uh, Marie McPherson, I was out there this last week, and she's getting better. Uh, she's just as fast as ever, but physically she's uh, getting better also. Also, Marie Howard is still having a lot of trouble with her back and everything, and she's had more tests and more tests coming up over the next uh, uh, several days and weeks. It's good to see Tommy McGee here. Uh, he said he's feeling better, uh, a little wobbly, but he's doing great, and he looks good, so we're glad to have him. Also, uh, Friday, I believe it was, we were, uh, Ben Dooley at Villa Hospital uh, with kidney stones, and was able to take care of one of them, but had another one, and we don't have an update on any of that, so if you hear anything, please let me know, and I'll make an announcement. If you haven't noticed, I've heard Kevin and family on vacation. They'll be back next week. Uh, Robbie's gone. Jim Patterson will be covering the lessons. Uh, this afternoon, 2 p.m., on the Purpose Road, there's going to be a uh, doctor shower honoring Justin and Morgan Arsenault uh, in the fellowship room. A day boy is expected. Uh, there is a new truth for today, uh, John uh, 1 through 12. Uh, Terry is in the office, if you see Jim or myself or someone, each one is $26. Uh, ECAP Church of Christ is hosting this youth series tomorrow night at 7 p.m. If you would like to go, be here at the church building at 6.30, and you're driving the van right now. Jim Patterson is driving the van. Uh, the last thing I have is the ice cream supper and the potluck luck for luncheon. Uh, we're going to have one uh, once uh, we can figure out when we're going to have it. So if anyone knows, let me know. I've got no announcements, but I'm not sure when it is. Any other comments? Now let's continue with the singing songs. The song for our opening prayer this morning will be 733. Take time to be healthy. 733.
thank you so much for this time of Lord's Day that you created and allowing us to be here for another portion of worship. We thank you, Father, for all the providential care that you show to us. Thank you for our food, our clothes, and our shelter, our families, and our friends, and this place where we may come and worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask, Father, that you would be with the leaders of our countries this day, Father, that you would help them to instill the things that are in accordance with your will. We pray, Father, you would defeat those who are trying to do things that are trying to tear our country apart and lead us in ways that you would not have us to go. We pray, Father, that you would be with Brother Jim this morning as he delivers the message to us and help him to have a ready recollection of those things that he has studied. And pray that you would be with us as listeners to listen to those things and check them with the scriptures, Father, and if they be found true to a love into our lives. We pray, Father, that you would be with the sick and afflicted of our number, that if it be your will, that could be restored to a good portion of hell. We pray, Father, you would be with those in the world less fortunate than ourselves. We pray that you would be with the lost. We pray that you would be with the homeless. We pray, Father, that you would give us opportunities to turn to run into people and, and be able to spread your message to them. We pray now, Father, as we go through this service, that you would forgive us our sins.
Yes, I bless us upon them and take a bit and we pray that we'll look back to the cross and remember him. Forgive us of our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
thank you so much for this time we have together here. And we know that everything that we have comes from you. And at this time, as we give back a portion of those things, and we ask that you will do so in a manner well pleasing unto me. In Christ's name we pray.
how we are to live as Christians. We have many things revealed to us in the New Testament in which we should pay close attention to. We ought to understand that God has communicated to us about our character, how we are to work on our character. He has given us examples that we should follow, that we should look at and understand how they behave and understand that God put those examples down for us in the pages of His Word that we might know and understand how we should live. God has told us how that in our service to Him, we should be meek. We'll be looking at that this morning. I'd like for us to open our Bibles to 1 Chronicles 29. 1 Chronicles, verse 29, chapter 29, rather, verse 5. This has in its scope the laying up of materials for the temple as it would be built under Solomon. 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 5 says, The gold for things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers, and who then is willing to consecrate this service this day unto the Lord. We think about what is being asked at the end of that verse. Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day to the Lord? I think meekness comes into bear quite a bit. We think about what it means to have freedom in this land, in this country. We have a lot of laws to protect our freedoms, and we have a lot of power then to do what we will. We can get things done that we want to get done. A lot of times that other people don't have freedom to pursue. They don't have that power. The question is, who is willing? Where does our will lie? Are we willing to do God's will? We sang a moment ago about the greatest example of meekness and his prayer to God was, let thy will be done. We think about the power that was vested in the person of Christ. The power that was there. We even sing another song about the 10,000 angels he could have called, but he didn't. He did the Lord's will and suffered and died. Think this is greatly then to be emulated as it is seen in the person of Christ as are all of his attributes to be emulated by those who would be his disciples. Us, Christians. In this day and time of uh, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 5, the question was being asked about materials and service, those things that could be done to accomplish this great task of building the temple. Verse 9, if you look down a few verses, it says there is rejoicing. The people did rejoice, and they, they offered willingly because of the perfect part they offered willingly to the Lord, and David the king also rejoiced with great joy. We were playing ping pong yesterday outside, and I was playing with my sons and nephews and niece, and uh, my daughter was in on it some, and we were playing in pairs. Daddy, Daddy played for a while. But I think we can all attest to the fact that it takes some control over the power that you have. You could smack that ball halfway across the yard if you want. Wouldn't do any good. But you can do it. And you have that power, but you bring that power under control, and that's a kind of meekness, if you will. That's defining meekness. Power under control. Our will needs to align with the will of God. We need to bring our power under the, under the power of God. And this is what people were rejoicing over in, in the day of David and Solomon here, that they had done this, they had uh, offered willingly, and they had been able to bring all of this material and talent together and continue to work on building the temple under Solomon. David is also able to rejoice with great joy there in verse 9. But there was a cooperative willingness to do God's will. We only read about this a few times if you think about it in the Word of God that it's expressly given to us. You read about it in the days of Joshua that uh, the people were willing to follow God and His will under Joshua's leadership. You read about it in what we were talking about this morning in Nehemiah's day, the restoration, that people were collectively, God's people, the Israelites, 
days of Solomon, days of David, and they're able to bring materials together and offer willingly. God wants us to have a meek attitude and stewardship and service. God wants us to have a meek attitude about the things that we can do and accomplish in this life as Christians, as disciples. And He has shown us this in great many examples, and we'll look at a few of those. The first point we want to recognize is that He wants us to have this meekness of attitude and spirit so we can recognize His greatness and give glory to Him. If we are puffed up, if we are vain in our imaginations about our own abilities, our own things, so then we're not going to recognize God for what He's able to do and accomplish. We're not going to see God acting through us. We're just going to see us doing what we wanted to do. But in meekness, there's humility. And we recognize God's greatness. We can recognize His greatness as good things are done. Paul said, I have planted Apollo's water, but God giveth increase. Great point. It was not the good things that Paul did, not the great things that the apostle was able to himself do. It was the power vested in the word that Paul preached from place to place. First Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. It was the word, the gospel, Romans 1 16, that was the power of God in the salvation. And that power is under control as it is handled aright, as it is believed and obeyed. Romans 10, verse 17. Faith. It brought about the hearts of individuals who will meekly accept the word. <coughs> Humbly accept the word. A great example of meekness is in the person of Job. Job was greater than all the men of the East. We're studying this on Wednesday nights. Job was greater than all the men of the East, but he was a godly man. He feared God. He eschewed evil. He was held aloft as an example before even the, the adversary Satan. He was a meek individual who had a lot of power, a lot of things at his disposal, a lot of things he could have done if he just wanted to, but he chose to be a godly individual. He chose to remember God and sacrifice. He chose to remember even offer the sins, potential sins of his own family. Abraham is a great example of meekness. We find that he is blessed with riches. He is blessed with uh, a lot of servants and so forth. Abraham in the Old Testament Genesis and the record is given to us that uh, even when he is given a son and God tells him to offer his son upon the altar and the question is raised, well where is the animal for sacrifice? What does he say? He remembers God and is still in control, doesn't he? And he says, the Lord will provide. That's meekness. That he remembers God's power and control in all things. And the power of God was there. Even, the book of Hebrews says, to raise again his son from the dead. And so Abraham's hand would not have been stayed had it not been for the one sent to stay it. We can recognize God's greatness as good things are done and so we can be meek and we can give God the glory by looking at the example of Moses. I think that uh, Bible class this morning was on the first part of the life of Moses and all the other classrooms. All the kids learned about the first 40 years, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And the life of Moses he, he is said to be the one who was meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. He was someone who wielded a great amount of power, but was himself allied only to the will of God. People contested with him. His own brother and sister contested with him about how that God had also spoken through them. Why were they not being honored and so forth. But Moses fell upon his face before Korah, Nathan, and Abiram. God handled those situations, didn't he? Moses pleaded with the Lord to remove Miriam's leprosy. Moses was one who was meek and 
Yes, me, above all those that are upon the face of the earth. Great example. And Jesus is indeed the prophet raised, like unto him, spoken of in those passages and also in the New Testament. Jonah was one who was meek. Now, I didn't say he was flawlessly meek, but he, he first turned and went and did what he wanted to do, but he did go and preach the word to Nineveh, didn't he? And when he did that, the city repented. <coughs> the city turned and repented to sackcloth and ashes. The city was preserved because of the preaching of Jonah and what he was able to remind the people of that God would destroy them for their wickedness if they didn't turn from that wickedness. Secondly, we can understand our own limitations if we are meek. We can see the ingredient of humility there and meekness. In our own limitations, we find the words of men such as Solomon in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6, where he turns his armor bearer and says uh, to the young men, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised, that it may be that the Lord will work for us. There is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. So Jonathan is remembering that the Lord works by many or by few. He, maybe he's remembering back to the days of Gideon, Judges chapter 7, verse 2. The Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. Similar language is used in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 says we're to be transformed, not conformed to the world, but it also says that we're to give our lives, uh, we are to live and give that reasonable service unto God. And then in verse 3 it says that through the grace is given to me, Paul says, that every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to God and dealt that every man the measure of faith. again in the New Testament. In addition to the example of Christ, we have the words of Paul, and we have those references from Jonathan and Gideon. Let's look also to 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, in the person, in the, the very life of Paul, in his own body, there was given this thorn of the flesh that he might not be exalted over much, but uh, that he might be Humble. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, where it says, Lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to puppet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. So God wants us to be humble, and God definitely wants us to be deep. Think about it, all that the apostles could do, and all they were commissioned to do. And there was great power there. For laying on of the hands and the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit that were then present in the first century. Great power there. A lot uh, on their shoulders. But they had to be meek. They definitely had to be humble to be meek. Over in 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 9. It says, Who makes you to differ from another? Uh, what hast thou that you did not receive? If you did not receive it, why do you glory as that you have not received it? Verse 8, If you're full, or now you're full, now you're weak. You have reigned as kings without us, and I would, to God, that you did reign, that he might also, or we might also, reign with you. And then he says in verse 9, I think that God has set forth us the apostles' last, as it were appointed to death. We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. The apostles, as I said, wielded great power. And they were meek individuals. Now sometimes you see a little bit of that power peeking out in Acts chapter 13 where Paul dealt with Elamus, the sorcerer. You see some of that power that is exposed in what was able to be done with uh, such 
such things as in, in the company of the apostles, there was earthquakes, uh, there was the salvation of all the souls in the boat, the shipwreck with, with Paul, the end of the book of Acts. You have great things that transpired in the book of Acts because of and for the apostles. And it is through the power of Christ that these things are done, and the Holy Spirit that these things are done. But here he's talking about this in this passage that the apostles are set forth. And, and they, are, they have all this power, great power, and it's in control. It's only allowed to and under the will of God, the will of Christ. They're furthering the gospel. They're carrying this forth, and they're doing so deeply, understanding their own limitations, understanding the greatness of God who is with them. And thirdly, God would have us to be meek and our service, and our stewardship to Him, so that His will can be done mightily in us. We think back to the great faith that was shown by Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as the law of the land would enforce idolatry under Nebuchadnezzar. We see the they said to the king, before they were cast into the furnace, we know that our God can deliver us. But whether He will or not, we will not bow down to this image. They knew that they couldn't. They knew that they should. They would not. And so we have record that they were cast into that furnace and that God did deliver them. But it was meekness on their part to say respectfully as they did to the king in such words as could be used convey this bold thought. God can deliver us. And whether he does or not, we're not going to do that with the wrong. God's will can be done mightily in us. This is 21st century. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, Paul says, By the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I really appreciated all that Brother Sanders had to say during his lesson, but he said more than once those, that uh, series of statements that uh, ended with, by the grace of God, I'm not what I used to be. Paul was not what he used to be. By the grace of God, he is an apostle. By the grace of God, he is a servant of Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, he was able to labor more abundantly than all. And he claims not the, the credit for himself. He just says, it's by the grace of God that was with me. But these things were done. That's great meekness and humility being shown in these words. The first Corinthians. All about the victory and the resurrection, isn't it? What we can look at in 1 Corinthians 15 should give us all a sense of Humility and recognition of the great power of God, even over death itself. And our own weakness, our own inability to come to such an end. So we would have a look at the judgment. We would look at the end of life with a calm sense of humble weakness. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. Colossians 1, verse 29 says, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his workings, which worketh in me my belief. Paul acknowledges. He's, no, he's not detached from reality. He understands that he works day by day. He understands that he's working no matter where he is. He understands that he is able to effectively bring people to see the truth in a lot of situations. He understands all of this, but he also sees that God is with him in all that he's doing. Do we see that, brother? Do we see that God is with us in what we are doing day by day? Uh, are we seeking to spread the word? Are we seeking to reach people with the gospel? We can be unique individuals with that, not just beat people out the head with the Bible, but calmly and rationally, hopefully, persuading them of things pertaining to the truth. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in himself. Look also to Philippians 2 verse 13, 
It is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. We're talking about how God works and can work mightily through us. Us. That uh, it is indeed the case that we are Christians like the Ephesians were Christians. We are Christians like the Philippians were Christians. But also 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 11. We pray always for you. That our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness. And the work of faith with power. We don't have the miraculous things that were going on in the first century anymore. But we've got power, don't we? Power in the Word. We've got power to reach souls and that if we will persuade them of the truth and they will obey it, believing in it, they can be saved. That's real power. We ought to wield that with peace. We ought to look to it and say, well, it's not what I say that makes a difference. It's what the Word of God says that makes a difference. So 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 11, mentions specifically the way that faith is with the power. It is. It has to be. Otherwise, faith has no good in it at all. Faith is with power. And that power must be coupled with meekness, as all power must be. Having looked at these things this morning, and taken these three points, into account that God would have us to be meek in stewardship and service, recognizing His greatness, our own limitations, and then also that He would be able to work through us finally, greatly. God utilizes those that will submit to Him in all things. I meant to begin the lesson this morning with an extension of my gratitude to the congregation here for letting me work with you. And as things get come up in my mind so many times, this uh, this lesson that I got started all of its own accord, it seems like. But uh, I have enjoyed working with the congregation here, and I want you to know that. And I appreciate the invitation to speak to you. I want you to know that it is indeed uh, a great pleasure to labor day by day in the Word and alongside heaven that uh, we're able to visit, we're able to put things together in the bulletin, we're able to manage and, and to work with the website, we're able to do a lot of things day by day and reach out to the lost because of your work, assistance, and support. And we appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the elders for uh, asking me to speak today, but uh, having said all these things, I want to offer the invitation. And it is God's invitation that people might let things be known that it might be a miss in their life. There's sin that needs to be taken care of. You can take this opportunity let it be known that you would confess those things that are wrong and that you are asking for God to forgive you. <coughs> Especially if it's a, a public thing. He wants you to know the invitation is open to the lost, open to sinners, open to those who would come to Christ on his own terms. The invitation is open for those that would lay hold on salvation. Believing Jesus as the Son of God. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Believing the gospel. Repenting of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Acts 3, verse 19. Confessing Jesus as the Son of God. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And being baptized for the remission of sins. This is God's way of salvation. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. If you have a need to make your life right, don't you let it be known. Why did Jesus reign?
thank you so much for being able to do that without any fear. We know that others that gather together on the Lord's Day throughout the world do not have that that blessing, that they do not have that ability to meet and to together and to worship you without fear. And we ask that you never never to uh, never let us forget that fact and never take it for granted. Pray that we are always allowed that freedom in this place that we live in. We ask that you would be with everybody here this morning. Those that are traveling, we ask that you would help them to get to their destination safe. We ask that you be with those that are not here this morning for illness or <coughs> other reasons. We just ask that, that you would be with them. We pray that, that you will forgive us when we fail you. We pray that, that we leave here and we, we do remember that our strength is in you and, and that we live our lives not, not being proud of ourselves but, but looking to you for our strength and realizing that the salvation we have and the hope we have and the blessings we have are all from you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.